Good afternoon and welcome to Scotia iTrades webinar. My name is Conleaf, the Client Education Specialist with Scotia iTrade. I'm pleased to present to you today ETFs 101, an introduction with Horizons ETFs. Before we get started, let's take care of some housekeeping items and then we will jump right in. So your sound quality should be good, but if you want to check your sound quality, just click on, on the sound check link in the audio panel of your GoToWebinar toolbar. Now the setup window may be on your secondary screen if you're using two monitors. And also, please be reminded that everyone will be muted for sound quality purposes today. And if you're using to your computer audio and are experiencing sound quality issues, you may wish to switch over to the telephone and just give us a phone call via the conference number that you see on the toolbar. Just don't forget to use the access code and your audio pin ID. As a quick reminder, unless otherwise expressly stated by Scotia iTrade, seminars, webinars, and other educational tools and resources, which is collectively called the content, are provided by independent third parties they're not affiliate, that are not affiliated with Scotia iTrade or Scotia Capital Inc. Now, just to keep in mind, the presentation that we're going to be providing to you today is only for informational purposes, uh, so please uh, keep that in mind. Now, let's quickly review the toolbar features. The orange arrow that you see at the top of the toolbar can be used to minimize or maximize the toolbar. In addition, you can use the hand icon to notify a question or a concern if you may have. You can view this in full screen mode as well by clicking on the computer icon that you see on the, on the panel. Now, we would prefer that you use the question uh, panel box uh, on the GoToWebinar. Just type your question in. I'll be monitoring those questions as the presenter goes through, and I'll be able to notify them of, of those questions. Um, we may choose to, the presenter may choose to um, address those at the Q&A session after. But, uh, but do type in your questions in the question panel box, and I'll keep continue to monitor, monitor those and to interact with you there. Today's session will be pre-recorded. Um, today's session will be recorded, and we will email you the link uh, by mid-afternoon tomorrow um, with, uh, with a link to that uh, recording. Now, alternatively, you can visit our YouTube channel, which is the Webinars On Demand playlist, if you would like to see some of the archived webinars we've got available there for you. So you can make notes if you'd like. However, we will be uh, downloading the PDF of version of this PDF at the of this session um, at the end of uh, today's uh, webinar. So uh, just give us about 30 seconds, and I'll have um, the deck uploaded for you, so you can actually download it uh, for review at your convenience. So today we have with us Horizons ETFs. Horizons has a, an ETF learning series uh, that they provide for educational purposes. Today, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start off now with Series 1, which is the Getting Started with uh, ETF Series. Uh, the first in that lot is the ETFs 101. So, uh, so, and you can see there the list of the other uh, presentations in the, in the series. Now, we have uh, pretty well most of these on the archive channel, on the YouTube channel. So if you'd like, if you've missed one of them, you may want to just visit our YouTube channel and review those as well. But nevertheless, we'll start off with today with the Series 1 and ETS 101, and then we'll go forward over the course of uh, the remainder of this year and, and, and beyond uh, with the others in the series. So today we have with us Mark Noble. He's the head of the uh, sales strategy, VP communications, and public relations. He's been with Horizons ETFs for more than seven years and is responsible for its external communications and sales strategy. Mark is a strong proponent of financial literacy and ETF education. Education. He works closely with Horizon Sales and the marketing teams to build out the client educational tools, as he's doing with us now, and initiatives um, that help us as Canadians become better uh, ETF investors. So prior to being with Horizons, Mark um, was a personal finance journalist at the Advisor Group, which is a leading financial services publication that serves the Canadian financial advisor market. So at this point, I'm going to pass the presentation back over to Mark, and he'll be able to facilitate us for the next little while with uh, ETS 101 today. Mark? Perfect. Thank you so much, and it's always a pleasure to be here with uh, Scotia iTrade. I uh, very much enjoy doing these sessions, and particularly enjoy doing this one because it's uh, focused uh, exclusively on ETFs and, and learning about ETFs. So I'm going to make the assumption today uh, 
that uh, everyone uh, on this call has somewhat of a limited knowledge of ETFs or are relatively new to ETFs. And what I'm going to say about that is that's okay uh, because we're um, <clears throat> we're going to make we're going to go through a lot of the key basics on ETF investing so that hopefully by the end of this session you feel a little bit more comfortable about using your uh, Scotia iTrade platform to potentially look at some ETFs that you may think are right for your portfolio. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen here and move to a slide, <clears throat> move to the uh, slide share move mode there. So this is called ETFs 101 and it's an introduction to ETFs and active investing and the active investing part just being at the end, I'll talk about a couple little academic things about investing that don't just fit hand in hand with ETF investing but fit with investing uh, in general. So our agenda will be, of course, what is an exchange traded fund. I'll spend most of the time in the presentation today talking about this part, talking about some of the key features of ETFs and why they've become so prevalent. And in addition to that, we'll talk about the Canadian landscape. So we'll talk about why ETFs are popular, why they've sort of become the the uh, topic du jour, if you will, or the or the hot product in Canadian investing. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, other aspects of investing to keep in mind as a refresher uh, before you begin your journey on becoming an ETF investor. Uh, as Conleaf uh, mentioned earlier, please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will try to uh, frequently check in and see uh, if something comes up. But most likely what will work best is if you have questions at the end. Uh, if it's imperative, though, uh, feel free to uh, let the organizer know, and, I, and I'll try to address it as we go along. So starting off with ETFs explained, what is an ETF? Or as I usually find in these kind of uh, presentations, what is an EFT? Yeah, that's, that's a joke, but I have a lot of people who get confused by the acronym even. So ETF, as its, as its acronym implies, is an exchange, is an exchange traded fund. Now, this is very interesting because exchange traded funds are actually a made in Canada invention. Uh, a, totally unique investment structure that was created in Canada in 1990, almost two years before it started to find prevalence in the United States. And the idea behind it was pretty simple. Uh, when we're talking about ETFs, and I'm talking here just about the structure, we're talking simply about an investment tool or investment structure that has uh, many of the beneficial features of a stock and many of the beneficial features of a mutual fund. Now, many of you that are that are new to investing or have been investing for a while have probably been well versed in some of the benefits of mutual funds. But you know, mutual funds, which were invented in the 1920s and really started to catch on in the 1970s and 1980s with North American investors, uh, brought scale to uh, end investors. So the idea of buying um, one or two stocks. Uh, you know, was always possible for most investors, but buying a multitude of stocks in one portfolio uh, was something that was very expensive. And so a mutual fund uh, allowed investors to do was really combine a diversified set of stocks, hold let's say 20 to 50 stocks or 20 to 50 bonds, uh, most of the time actively managed by a professional portfolio manager and allowed you to have uh, that kind of institutional, when we say institutional, but we're talking about scale that larger investors would have had. So mutual funds really level the playing field for Canadian and North American investors to be invested broadly in a multitude of markets. Uh, some of the drawbacks of mutual funds uh, are that, you know, you can't buy them throughout the day. Uh, they are priced at the end of day with a net asset value. And when I say net asset value, which I'm going to refer to as NAV on a go forward basis on this presentation, uh, what I'm referring to is the cumulative market value of the underlying security. So mutual funds are what we refer to as an open-ended investment trust. And so part of the advantage of not only allowing diversification for you to hold a wide breadth of stocks or bonds, they also, that fund, price because it was priced at the end of day was always reflective of its net asset value that is the underlying value of all of the uh, securities held in the mutual fund in aggregate uh, the price of the mutual fund reflects that so if all the underlying uh, stocks of a mutual fund went up a dollar uh, in aggregate then the price of the mutual fund also goes up in aggregate of a dollar so there was never any real disconnect between the price of the unit of the mutual fund and the value of the underlying cost of security so if you think of it as a box of um, 
a box of goods, you know, whether I pulled out all the box of goods and sold them separately for $100 or I charged $100 for the box, the price is the same. And that was a unique feature from, uh, from mutual funds. What mutual funds didn't do, as I just mentioned, is they don't trade during the day. Uh, they're sort of hard to look up. Uh, most of the time they were uh, intermediated um, uh, by having to buy them directly from the mutual fund provider. Uh, so you have to call, usually work through an advisor, although obviously on Scotia I trade, you can uh, use their great platform to get exposure to mutual funds. And there's still a, a very, I would argue, a very strong place for mutual funds in a portfolio, uh, particularly in lower dollar accounts. I still own mutual funds, even though I've worked for an ETF provider for seven years. So this is not a, this is, there's nothing bad about mutual funds. They're, they are uh, the original open-ended investment trust, and they're still an important way for you to get diversified exposure, depending on the asset class. On the flip side of mutual funds, we obviously have stocks. Now, stocks, as we're all familiar with, are just the individual equities of, of companies. And some of the nice things about stocks are, uh, of course, intraday liquidity. And I'm going to just get the uh, highlighter here, so we're all we're all following what I'm talking about. But we have the intraday liquidity over here. Uh, obviously, that means you can buy at any time during the day. So if you want to be someone who trades in the morning, you can trade in the morning. If you want to sell in the afternoon, you could do that. So there's a little more flexibility when you buy. Uh, they're marginable. You can use margin counter leverage to buy uh, stocks, uh, and if you have a margin count set up, that no problem. Uh, you can sell stocks short. Well. I don't know how many of you would do that at this point in time, but it, generally speaking, you can move against a uh, move against a stock. And of course, there's no minimum purchase, and there's no stop loss and limit orders. So these are all kind of cool things about stocks. The other piece I would highlight is each stock has a symbol, so it's easy to follow. You can go onto your iTrade platform, or you could use Google Finance or Yahoo Finance, whatever kind of features you like to use online to look up the symbol of the stock. And there'll be all kinds of technical analysis tools or other types of commentary on the stock that you wouldn't quite see with mutual funds, which tend to be more closed. So we're obviously here to talk about ETFs. What the heck does any of this have to do with ETFs? Well, ETFs very similarly, uh, very simply, uh, combine what we would say are the best features of both of those structures. So ETFs trade uh, during the day like a stock and can be purchased any time during the day. And they have all the other features of a stock, such as marginable, can be sold short, can be used limit orders and stop losses. However, uh, they also provide a portfolio of a diverse amount of securities uh, underneath them. So like a mutual fund, they uh, have a net asset value uh, that is reflective of the underlying value of the securities, and they hold a multitude of securities. So when people ask me very simply in one sentence, what is an ETF? An ETF is pretty much a mutual fund that trades on an exchange like a stock. And uh, one of the reasons that it's become so popular is obviously low cost. Uh, when you eliminate the uh, sales and distribution structure of selling mutual funds, which are dealt directly uh, out of um, <clears throat> out of the individual mutual fund providers' offices, so they have accounting and salespeople to deal with that. Uh, ETFs, for example, don't have any of that primary market apparatus. They trade on what we call the secondary market, meaning they trade like a stock and can be purchased at any time uh, during the market trading orders using a platform like Scotia I Trade. Uh, that eliminates a lot of costs associated with ETFs as a structure, so it's actually a cheaper structure. It's similar to more of, you know, if I was to uh, compare something like digital music to analog music, you know, analog music, you have the physical, let's say, CD or, or, or record, I guess a lot of people buy records these days, uh, versus the digital, um, sort of the flexibility of the digital distribution. So ETFs are sort of more the digital, uh, uh, I would say the digital uh, distribution of investment securities. And so that's what they are. ETFs are like a mutual fund that trade like a stock and they trade in the secondary market. Therefore, they can be purchased uh, very easily using any kind of brokerage account. So again, here's how mutual funds work, and uh, we can see that, um, <clears throat> you know, very simply when we have mutual funds, we have uh, the buyers here who can uh, buy uh, directly from the fund company, and the fund company can also sell directly from the fund company, and the fund company is in charge of going to the market and uh, eliminating, uh, um, eliminating the, <clears throat> excuse me, just with erasing those drawings, 
eliminating the uh, cost of, of going to the market. So you have the fund company out there going to the stock exchange. If you wanted to buy the uh, Canadian equities, the more the mutual fund manager picks their 20 Canadian equities, the fund company goes to the stock exchange, buys those Canadian equities on behalf of the mutual fund, and the buyer gets that at the end of day value. <clears throat> ETFs have a much more complex system. We don't need to dwell on this too much, but this is basically how they become a mutual fund that trades on the exchange, is you have a buyers and sellers now dealing directly with the exchange instead of the mutual funds uh, company. So you're, again, buying in a secondary market like a stock. <clears throat> Now, if you want to just follow me on this part, this is really the really important part about how the structure of the product works. The ETFs rely on what we call a market maker. So the market maker is uh, the six large capital markets groups of Canada generally, so the, the big banks, and they have a capital markets group that trades against ETFs uh, to ensure the ETFs trade close to their, to their net asset value, therefore that making them, you know, the price of the ETF reflective of the underlying securities. So when you put it in order to buy an ETF, so you find a ticker symbol, like our largest ETF ticker symbol is HXT, which is the TSX Canadian 60, uh, which holds the largest 60 uh, stocks in Canada. If I was to buy HXT, I would simply go to my iTrade account, look up HXT, put in the bid, at, put in my, my order based on the bid, and the, what happens is that instead of going to the mutual fund company, uh, that order would get routed to the ETF market maker, who would then either go to the market and have uh, units already available for sale to you. So think of them as sort of a wholesaler. If we were thinking about like an Amazon.ca, uh, they would have units already available. You know how they usually say like nine or ten stock uh left in stock, you would have sort of a similar sort of thing with an ETF market maker where they're probably sitting on anywhere from 5,000 to you know, 500,000 units of the ETF, um, which they could sell to you immediately, or because it's an open-ended investment trust, if uh, for whatever reason your, your order size was larger than what the market maker had on hand, uh, then they would go to the ETF provider, uh, they would go to the market. This all happens simultaneously using multi-million dollar software, I just want to highlight. But they would simultaneously on this side uh, get the underlying securities that comprise the, the ETF. So in this case, they would buy the uh, 60 uh, stocks uh, that are held in the TSX 60, and they would give that to the ETF provider, and the ETF provider, therefore, would uh, give the ETF market maker those ETF units and the market maker would put those back on the exchange and either sell them back to you or buy them from you. So that's how that works and it's a slightly different uh, way of going about buying and selling in the market but the key here is this now allows you to have these low cost exchange traded funds available for purchase in the secondary market. Um, if there's any more questions on that later on, I'm happy to revisit that. Um, if you had trouble understanding any of this, uh, don't feel any, in any way, shape, or form that you're falling behind. I, I give this presentation to uh, pension funds with people who manage billions of dollars, and even they like to get a better sense of how this works. This is still a new technology in the market uh, versus other types of technology, and it's something that's not readily understood. So that's why we're taking the time today to explain that. So one of the big ways that uh, the big appeal of ETFs, of course, has become low management fees. Um, and when you hear the financial press in particular, uh, you know, when you read the Globe and Mail or the Financial Post, you rarely hear them talking about mutual funds these days, but you do hear them talking a lot about ETFs and the growth of ETFs. And a big reason for that is the low management fees of access to ETFs. Now, one thing that needs to be uh, highlighted here, uh, and I will get into a little bit more in the presentation, but Essentially, what what ETFs, the majority of ETFs do is they provide exposure to what we call indexes or passive uh, benchmarks. So I use the example of TSX60. I'm going to move back to that. So the TSX60 is just what we would call uh, an aggregate of the 60 largest stocks in Canada, and each stock in the portfolio is weighted by its uh, a proportional weight and size. So Royal Bank of Canada is the largest stock in Canada by its market value, therefore it's the largest stock in the TSX 60. And I believe TD is number two and maybe Suncor is number three and a bunch of the banks after that. So you have these very, very large stocks uh, that are weighted accordingly. Now, a lot of data has shown that if you index um, in Canada, for example, 
the stats are roughly uh, about 75% of actively managed mutual fund managers uh, underperform the TSX 60 or the TSX composite, which is a larger version of the same index uh, that with, with about 300 stocks. They under, outper, underperform that on a five-year basis, about 75% of them. So really only about one in, one in four uh, Canadian mutual fund managers beats the TSX, uh, six, TSX composite index on a, on a five-year basis. Uh, when we use U.S. equities using the benchmark there, which is the S&P 500, which are the 500 largest stocks in the United States, uh, we've had periods where um, zero have beat it on a five-year basis, although that changed over last year. But generally speaking, you're looking at probably less than 10% of actively active managers beating that benchmark. So there's been a wholesale movement, particularly since the last two large financial crises, which was the first one in 2002, 2001, 2002 with the tech wreck, and then of course 2008, 2009 with the financial services crisis. With both of those uh, crises, uh, there's been more of a movement towards indexing, uh, investors realizing that they don't want to really necessarily pay uh, higher fees for active management if most of the returns can be generated through these indices. So the big appeal of ETFs, going back to why we're talking about low management fees, is that ETFs generally offer rock bottom pricing uh, to the large um, asset classes that most Canadian investors are buying. So if I use the example uh, of the Canadian uh, large cap Canadian equity market, uh, I think the average MER of the ETFs that offer exposure to Canadian equities is around 30 basis points and it's probably closer to about 1.5% for an actively managed mutual fund. So you're looking at uh, a huge difference in fees. Now here I'm just going to use a hypothetical example. It's not necessarily reflective of all the pricing ETFs. We have ETFs in Canada, by the way, that trade for as low as three basis points. There's one at three basis points and a few at five basis points. So to give you some context, that would be uh, five cents uh, in fees for every thousand dollars of exposure. Uh, rock bottom cheap. It's basically f almost free exposure. Uh, whereas most mutual funds in Canada are well into the one percent. And of course, when you add on uh, advice fees, they usually end up being more than 2%. So ETFs are a much lower cost way to get essentially the same exposure to a lot of, of the same asset classes. You'll find that a large cap Canadian equity manager uh, may indeed outperform uh, the index, but generally speaking, their returns are very close to what an index would be. And people are finding they'd rather have the known cost of fees saved by opting for a lower fee product than pay uh, an a high management fee for advice, uh, or, or portfolio management, I shouldn't say advice, but portfolio management uh, with the hopes that you know maybe it outperforms, maybe it doesn't. So you, within index, you're getting a known quantity with active management, you're relying on the trust of the portfolio manager. So when we just look, break it down on fees, um, we end up seeing this being substantial, and this is all because of the obviously very powerful force of compounding. Uh, if you're losing 2% a year to fees, uh, you, you know, you're losing about 8% in return over a four-year basis. And, like, that's, and that's substantial if you think about the fact that the average annual equity return is probably in the 6 to 7% range. Um, so what ETFs do and the reason they become popular is they generally offer lower cost exposure in most asset classes to what would be available on the mutual fund side. It doesn't always hold true, but it's general, a general statement. It's fairly accurate. So in this example, we see that we have an ETF that uh, of $100,000 that's invested at uh, 70 basis points or 0.7%. And we have a mutual fund, and we're going to make the assumption that they generate effectively the exact same return, but it's at 2.25%. Now, on a one-year basis, that maybe doesn't seem like a huge difference in fees, um, but... Uh, with the power of compounding, it ends up being absolutely substantial uh, because your management fees over a 15-year period on the ETF would be about $45,000 for that period um, that you would lose. So roughly, you know, 45% of your original $100,000 investment is fairly significant, even at 70 basis points. But if we look at the mutual fund, we'd actually see that we pay more in fees than the original principal investment over that time. So your differential in savings is actually about $83,000 over 15 years or 83% on a 15-year basis. 15-year time rise is not a huge amount of time. Uh, 
So this is the real power of known cost of investing. You can't control what the markets are going to do. The markets are going to be subject to volatility and macroeconomic issues and earnings and all sorts of a multitude of factors. But you can control how much you pay to get exposure to the markets. And what more and more investors are embracing is the idea that by reducing your costs to be an investor in ETFs, uh, you generally can save some of these known costs, which obviously compound over time to work in your favor. So a very important concept there and really the real big reason why there's been a big movement towards ETF investing in Canada. Now, going back to market makers, again, I want to just highlight that, you know, this is something that's very different uh, in terms of how you're dealing with um, <clears throat> selling, buying and selling ETFs. So I, I've made the case here why people move towards ETFs. There's 500 ETFs in Canada uh, offered across 24 different providers now. Uh, it used to be six. Uh, when I started, it was three. <laughs> so we've seen the number of providers increase. Of course, you can track them by their ticker symbols. Uh, but what's different from stocks is some of you may be used to buying, you know, Royal Bank and putting in RY and seeing, um, <clears throat> you know, a bid ask spread and high amounts of volume. Is that ETFs as an open end investment trust? Uh, they trade slightly differently than a stock would. And uh, that's going back to how that market making process works. So again, market makers are the third party institutional traders who perform most of the ETF unit creation and redemption and order taking. And at least one market maker known as a designated broker will have a contractual obligation to the ETF provider. And what they'll be doing is they'll be making sure and they're legally obligated to do so that the ETF has liquidity and trades efficiently, meaning when I say trades efficiently, meaning the price of the ETF trades uh, reflecting the value of its underlying securities. And typically what they're doing is engaging what we call arbitrage. Um, and arbitrage just means that they're making sure that the price of the individual uh, stocks is uh, not too different from the price of the ETFs by trading back and forth the ETF and the stocks. And this is a good thing. They make a little bit of money on doing this, but for the end unit holders, it ensures that your price of your ETF is reflective of the value of the underlying securities. Secondly though, um, what, where it matters for you as an investors on iTrade is you need to understand that necessarily with an ETF, there may not be a high level of volume in the ETF. In fact, sometimes there might be less volume in the ETF than what you're willing to buy. So if you're going to buy a thousand units at $10, for $10,000, that's not a huge trade. I mean, it's a feasible trade for a lot of retail investors, and there are indeed ETFs in Canada that would trade less than 10,000 units a day. So you're looking on there and you're saying, oh my gosh, if I buy this ETF, I'm gonna be buying it all. Well, no, that's not what happens. What these market makers do is, unlike a stock where literally the posted volume is the amount of the stock you could buy, uh, with an ETF, the posted volume is really all that's traded. These ETF market makers have the ability to go and, as I said, like Amazon, go back to the warehouse and find a lot more of the stock you need to build that box full of security. So whether there's zero volume or 10 million volume, generally speaking, an ETF can be built uh, for you uh, in a matter of seconds uh, by the, by, or less than seconds in some cases, by these market makers to ensure that um, <clears throat> that you get the, the the ETF unit. Now, what you need to understand is the cost of doing that. They obviously don't do this for free. It's not a nonprofit uh, a gig. Is they look at the differential between uh, the bid and the ask. That is, you look when you're on your iTrade system, look at the bid and the ask. The difference between those two is generally the cost of building those ETF units. So. Uh, the harder it is to build the ETF units, so for example, building an ETF of large cap Canadian stocks is very easy. You may pay have a bid ask spread of two cents, right? Very, very, very cheap. But if they're building it of, let's say, high yield bonds or Canadian preferred shares, which are less liquid, you could have a bid ask spread of five to seven cents. Um, so it's important to understand that the underlying asset class uh, can have a larger bid ask spread. And that bid ask spread, is really the, the cost of execution for you on top of on top of the uh, commission that you pay uh, through iTrade. So keep that in mind that 
the wider that bid ask spread is, the more you're paying to create those units of the ETF. And that's an additional cost on top of the management fee. And this is where there is ends up being quite a bit of confusion with the ETF. So as a rule of thumb, I usually say that if uh, a bid ask spread is more than 40 basis points, meaning that if you take the cost of the ETF and divide it by the a number of cents that it is to buy it. So for on a $10 NAV, if you're looking at more than six or seven cents, um, that's something usually where it's, I wouldn't necessarily put in an order, I'd probably be more apt to call either iTrade or call the ETF provider directly and ask if there's something wrong with the trading. Sometimes these market makers who use uh, algorithmic trading software, they might miss market making for a certain ETF. Um, particularly lower volume ones, and that means that they may they may not even realize they're going to charge you more. So when in doubt, uh, before hitting trade, it's always worthwhile to call somebody. But this is, overall, this market making is a really wonderful system. That's why we call it an ecosystem. These market makers are making a tiny profit uh, on trading these ETFs, but by doing so, uh, they're creating all this liquidity and new units for you to buy, so that, again, you're buying a mutual fund, basically, that trades like a stock. Now in Canada, uh, I'm just using 2000, end of 2016 data. Um, it's actually changed quite a, no, it hasn't changed too much from that point. Uh, we're at about $122 billion now in assets uh, in ETFs in Canada, getting close to 125 probably by the end of this month. Um, and the large four ETF uh, providers, which are BlackRock, BMO, Vanguard, and Horizons ETFs, which is the company I work for, we account for well over 90% of the market share in Canada. So most of the ETF assets are dispersed uh, with uh, those, those large providers. Um, but that necessarily doesn't mean that you shouldn't use any of the other ETF providers. It just means that they're new to the market and they're still building their businesses. But most of the uh, large uh, gains in the business have been through those four large ETF providers, BlackRock Canada, uh, which is a subsidiary of BlackRock, which is a $5 trillion asset manager, largest asset manager in the world, um, is obviously the large dominant uh, player in Canada, uh, representing f roughly 47, I think they're closer to like 42% market share right now, and BMO Asset Management, the ETF division of the largest Canadian bank in Canada, uh, represents um, the fastest growing portion of the business and over close to 40% market share now. So those two uh, providers account for uh, over 80% of the market share. And then you have Vanguard and Horizons ETFs, a Vanguard known for being a low cost index provider and Horizons ETFs, my company, uh, we're more of a niche uh, ETF player in that, and when I say niche, I mean we offer a lot of actively managed ETFs and asset classes such as that you may not necessarily thought to get exposure to, such as leverage ETFs or commodities, we have a marijuana ETF. So we offer more of the periphery kind of specialty kind of ETFs, although we do have more of the core ETFs like that are indexing that would compete with Vanguard and BlackRock. But those are the four uh, major product providers in Canada. Um, so again, I just mentioned that as the end of last year, the ETF industry was roughly 115 billion in Canada. It's over 122 billion now. Um, and um, it was up 28.2 billion from the year before that. So it's been growing, the ETF business in Canada has been growing at roughly about 25% per annum, uh, which is a massive rate, basically doubling every four years. Uh, that said, it's still only about one-tenth the size of the Canadian mutual fund industry. So the Canadian mutual fund industry is about $1.3 trillion, last I checked, in assets under management. So it's still about 10 times the size of, of the ETF business. Why the ETF business and ETFs continue to gain so much more traction is because they're growing so much faster and taking a much larger percentage of net new assets going into Canadian investments. And in fact, uh, 2016 was an interesting year uh, because uh, in 2016, the amount of ETF assets in the self-directed channel, so that would be the discount brokers channel that you're all involved with, actually surpassed mutual fund assets. So there's now more money in ETFs in the self-directed channel than there is in mutual funds. However, when you talk about the advice channel, these are people that use advisors um, that, and primarily through the large Canadian banks, uh, they, you know, the lion's share of the assets still remains on, on the mutual fund side. So that's changing, but um, 
the attraction and all of the buzz around ETFs really has to result from the growth, not necessarily the AUM and these astronomical growth rates that ETFs have, have been at. But the long-term forecast for ETFs is probably somewhere around 200 to 250 billion dollars within the next 10 years. Um, at which point it probably growth will start to slow because again a lot of the growth is coming from net new assets people that have already been invested in mutual funds for a long time they don't tend to sell those and buy ETFs because there's all kinds of tax consequences and other things so that's a slow moving uh, beast uh, but a lot of the net new assets in the industry continue to go towards ETFs and then what are people buying? Well, really interesting to understand that actually the vast, uh, almost uh, last year, one out of every $2 uh, in, in Canadian ETF business um, tended to go towards uh, fixed income and the largest being investment grade fixed income. So Canada has the single largest amount of assets um, of any developed nation in fixed income in its ETF business. That's roughly 30% three percent of the Canadian ETF business is fixed income uh, whereas if I was to go to the United States I think it's around 12 percent and globally it's around 15 percent so it's about twice the the global average and one of the reasons for that is because uh, Canadian fixed income historically has been very uh, expensive and non-transparent so you pay a lot more to get it by bonds uh, you don't see fees on bonds, uh, but what happens is the yield gets reduced and it's a non-transparent cost when you buy an individual bond on a brokerage account. What ETFs have done is they've created what we call a lit market, meaning a transparent market, a low cost market to buy uh, uh, fixed income and a lot of people to diversify in fixed income. So a lot of money actually in Canada uh, goes towards fixed income and particularly investment grade fixed income ETFs, which provide exposure to a broad basket of bonds. Another big reason why people are using ETFs in particular to get fixed income exposure in Canada, of course, is also cost. Uh, yields, um, while they're probably on the rise over the next year as the Canadian uh, Bank of Canada starts to raise interest rates, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, yields are by any way, shape, or form high. You know, they're still probably on investment grade fixed income, less than 3%. Well, in the past, uh, paying you know 3% yielding bond fund that you're paying 1.5% management fees in, then you're losing literally half your yield, which is half the return, uh, to fees. But now uh, we have uh, fixed income ETFs in Canada that are, can be bought for as low as nine basis points. So uh, if fixed income investors are increasingly choosing ETFs because particularly the fixed income, it's a fixed yield that you're earning, a fixed income as the name implies uh, so if you can reduce the cost for that fixed income you're keeping more of that in your pocket and there in a nutshell is why so many Canadians are moving towards fixed income uh, ETFs as, as a primary way to get exposure to fixed income now there's so many different types of ETFs now available if I'd done this presentation five years ago I probably would have had three buckets here uh, but we have index passive ETFs so those are the ETFs again that follow an index strategy we have active ETFs. Canada has one of the largest amount of active ETFs in the, in the world, and again, those tend to be in more of the fixed income category, which are less efficient. Uh, but they multi-factor ETFs, which are ETFs that reweight um, their exposure based on underlying factors such as low volatility or dividend. We also have what we call smart beta or strategic beta ETFs. That's really financial service marketing jargon, but what it means is that those ETFs are indices that reweight the stocks based on something other than market cap. So instead of holding the stocks in proportion to the stock size, they hold it some other way. And there's all kinds of really interesting strategies out there. I'm not saying that they're necessarily great strategies, but some weight them on momentum, some weight them on volatility, some weight them on growth, some weight them based on where the companies and the stocks and the portfolio make the money. Some of them weighted on, you know, volume there's all kinds of different ways of doing that and those ETFs tend to be on average a little bit more expensive than the traditional passive but they're also the area of the most growth in products and of course classes of ETFs pretty much if there's an investable asset class there's an ETF in Canada that tracks it so uh, you'd be hard-pressed to think of something that you couldn't get ETF exposure to and if you can't get ETF exposure to a certain asset class that you're looking for it's probably because that asset class such as something like private real estate 
isn't liquid enough to support the market making system that makes ETFs possible. So if it's a liquid asset class, there's most likely an ETF on it. So that includes commodities, equities, fixed income, currencies, levers, and inverse strategies as well. And again, just highlighting just how big these proliferation of strategies are. But what I want to highlight really with this particular slide is just to keep in mind that as you move to become an ETF investor, um, you know, a piece of, uh, you know, we're not supposed to offer advice, but just a suggestion is to try to keep it simple when you begin, uh, because simple makes it easier for you to make, you know, to focus on what you're doing. So you're probably looking at this bucket here, which is the traditional passive indexes. Why I'm highlighting this is you'll see that almost 75% of the assets in Canada are in these passive buckets. So three out of every four dollars invested in ETFs in Canada are in this passive bucket. But <coughs> most of the product launches, as you'll notice, passive sort of is is it, it's growing, but it's not growing at the same level that active and strategic beta and aggregate are growing. So you know, roughly one third of the ETFs now in Canada are active. And you know, just a little bit less than about a quarter are strategic. So between those two, uh, there's quite a bit of of the of of product offerings, not necessarily assets, that are strategic, beta, or active. And these ETFs, to be quite honest, even though our, my company is one that offers the large, one of the largest actively managed ETF providers, these are slightly more complex. And as you're moving to become an early ETF adopter, you know, you're probably going to be wanting to look more at this passive bucket. Uh, understanding how ETFs work and creating asset allocation strategies. Once you're comfortable there, you can probably then look at some of these other more complex strategies to further optimize your exposure. And in our educational series that we do with Scotia I Trade, we get more into talking about how to do that. But for this presentation, as new to ETF, this passive bucket is where we're spending a lot of our time today. And that's just because that's a little bit more straightforward. But as you see more ETF providers come to the market, you'll see them looking at this active and strategic beta area. And of course, those are more complex, um, but clearly lion's share of assets remain in this passive bucket. So again, what I'm just saying, indexing though, is while a simple default solution is not necessarily a one-size-fits-all solution, so it works well for public equities and government bonds, um, it may not work as well for things like Canadian preferred shares, corporate bonds, high-yield bonds, senior loans, alternatives, and municipal bonds. So these are primarily fixed income asset classes that aren't quite as liquid or transparent as equities, which make the market making process and indexing process a little bit more difficult. For that reason, it's particularly in Canada, it's why you've seen a big growth in active. Um, so it is important to understand that when you look at an ETF, uh, before you purchase that ETF, there's a few things you're going to want to do. Uh, number one, you're going to want to obviously see the pricing and make sure you're comfortable with the cost and the management fee. But I would also highlight that you go to the index, per, the ETF provider's webpage. Uh, you know, it clearly will say if it's Horizons, it'll say Horizons. If it's Vanguard, it'll say Vanguard. Look up the ETF symbol on that webpage and read about the investment objective. Make sure you clearly understand what they're doing. Are they tracking an index? Are they tracking a preferred active preferred share strategy or an index preferred share strategy? Uh, based on that, there are certain levels of efficiency. You can also look at other things such as Morningstar ratings, um, which usually give you a good indication of whether the ETF that you're looking at is something that provides efficient, low cost, and overall better uh, risk adjusted returns over a period of time. So, like all things, I mean, this is your money. We spend probably on average, I, I read somewhere, we spend somewhere like three to six hours. Uh, uh, researching, you know, whether what kind of TV we'd like to buy. Well, at the end of the day, they tend to do most of the same thing. Uh, where it's the complete opposite with investing, people don't spend nearly enough time looking at what they're buying, even though it's usually a larger cost and has a much more profound impact on your lifestyle. You know, take that extra time, if I had to, to say, to look at the literature put out by the ETF providers and make sure that you're finding something that fits for your risk return objectives. And, you know, things to keep in mind, again, as we look at the long-term uh, investment horizon of ETFs, is just to keep in mind that, you know, your long-term horizon works in your favor as we look at beta of being into the market. So um, most of your human capital 
uh, when we're looking at long term is we're talking about you know the salary that you make right so you know putting aside money and looking at you know low cost way to build a, a portfolio ETFs can be a really easy way to do that particularly in the early part of your investment stratosphere so if you're here towards the end sort of the 60 the 65 range um, you know this is get, can get quite complicated for it sorry this can become a little bit more risky for you where you need to be generating those higher returns but the earlier on you are in this line the more time you have to generate returns which means that ETS is a low cost exposure or something that's you know fairly simple for you to start building a portfolio and letting it you know stay in the market over the long term so this is a question here someone asked me if I could please uh, give a, an example of a passive ETF I just noticed uh, going back to that previous slide, sorry I missed that question. Uh, passive ETF, um, we're talking about a passive ETF, we're talking about an ETF that doesn't have a portfolio manager. So that's actually a, a great question, I didn't actually highlight that, I've been talking about an index. So a passive ETF would follow an index, uh, like the TSX 60, but there's no active security selection happening. So when I'm talking about index being a not a one-size-fits-all solution, I'm referring to an ETF where there's no portfolio manager who thinks that you know this stock is the hot stock to own and it's going to be better than the market. The index just owns the whole market in proportion to its size. So that's a passive investment. An active investment would be where there's a portfolio manager and most money in Canada is actively managed and the portfolio manager is using their own research and due diligence and experience to try to select ETFs that are stocks that they think are going to outperform. So really important to understand the difference. Passive, most ETF money in Canada is passive and means there's no portfolio manager making a call, therefore it's just in the market based on an index. Active means that, and most money in mutual funds is active, it means that the portfolio manager is using their discretion to try to generate better risk adjusted returns than the index. Historically what we found is that actually the majority of active managers don't outperform the index and usually a big reason for that is actually fees, that compounding of fees against them over a longer period of time. Um, you know, there, and that's why when I was highlighting indexing is not a one-size-fits-all solution, I'm referring to the fact that in some cases active management may make more sense than indexing and that's in these bottom asset classes down here. I'll uh, address the other question just at the end there. So one other thing I just wanted to keep in mind here, and this is going back to this question on passive, is the importance of asset allocation. So I'm an ETF person, and obviously I believe ETFs are the best investment solution, but more important than making the distinction of whether to buy an ETF or mutual fund is to make sure that you have the right asset mix, meaning you have the right mix of stocks, bonds, alternatives, cash, and uh, well, alternatives and cash, those are the big four. Um, asset allocation factor. So your decision to be in stocks over bonds is far more profound than owning let's say one stock over another because there are different correlations to those particular securities. They, they tend to move in opposite directions in markets. So there was a landmark study done in 1986 by Brinson, Hood and Bebauer which were three financial academics. It's one of the most widely studied investment studies in, in finance, and they've redone it a number of times to just reinforce that it's accurate. And what they found is that the determinants of portfolio performance, the variance of returns, uh, that 91.5% of your portfolio performance is comes from asset allocation. So what that means very simply for you, um, because that's all very technical, is your decision, for example, to be in Canadian bank stocks is far more important than owning RBC over TD and your decision to be in stocks, Canadian stocks is far more important than your decision to be in uh, than to be in Canadian bonds meaning that your decision to allocate a portion of your portfolio to an asset class whether you use an actively managed mutual fund, a passive ETF or buy the individual stocks getting exposure to that asset class is more important than how you get exposure to it. Um, so you know jumping in the water is more important <laughs> than than you know where you choose to swim and so that is really important takeaway from here and that I'm obviously extolling the virtues of ETFs but if you have a portfolio allocation strategy that's diversified across you know uh, different sectors of equities has some exposure to bonds has some cash for risk 
if you have that already built and you're using mutual funds and individual stocks and ETFs, I'm going to say two thumbs up. That's actually great. And so your asset allocation decision is much more important than buying an ETF. And the reason that I bring this up at the end is what will end up happening is I will do this presentation and someone will say, you know, I just was sat through hopefully a good presentation on ETFs and, you know, I really want to get into these ETFs. Well, that's not really the right way to look at investing. Where you want to look at is I want to be in the right asset classes that meet my risk return objective. So I, what I want you to take home from this is, you know, and we'll look at this in further presentations is, you know, I need to have more equity exposure. I need to have more bond exposure. I have too much corporate bond exposure. That's much more important decision than what ETFs you want to buy. So when I uh, typically do presentations, I say, you know, if you think of uh, when you get dressed in the morning, ask the allocation of your pants, what you choose to get exposure to are your socks and shoes. So your pants or your asset allocation, whether you choose to buy ETFs or mutual funds or your socks, and you know what asset, you know, and, and what kind of fee or strategy within those structures you use are your shoes. So that's really, you know, you're not gonna walk out the door without your pants on. It's really important that as an investor you have this set up before you even to choose to make the jump towards ETFs. I won't belabor this too much more. It's just I feel really important that it gets highlighted before we move forward in the presentation. Uh, with that, we're at 50 minutes is where I like to cut it off with questions. Again, this is an intro, so there's you know hours and hours we can go on in different tangents on the ETF business, but I really wanted you to uh, get just a basic understanding of how they work. And my next piece of uh, you know suggestion for you would be to go on to your Scotia iTrade platform and look up some of the ETF symbols, get a, a customized to some of the um, some of the pricing. Um, we're always available here at horizonsetfs.com to also help you get introduced to ETF investing. We even have a simulator that allows you to try your different types of of ETF investing without putting your own money in. So this is not something where you're going to do it alone. There are great customer service representatives at Scotia I Trade. There's great customer service representatives at Horizons ETFs. So before you start your ETF journey, you know, take a look at what you're looking at. And then if you have, I would say your next step then should be ask questions to some of these resources that are available to you. And then from there, maybe then we can, you can look at, you know, putting in some of your first ETF trades. Um, but I hope this uh, has been helpful and illuminating, just giving you a baseline understanding of what ETFs are and why they've become such a popular delivery of investment uh, solutions. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, move it to uh, questions. I'm just trying to pull that up here. Sorry, I had a question box here somewhere. Conleaf, just wondering if there's the ability for you to see the questions here. Yes, uh, actually, there is one question that Leah had asked, a second question, yeah. and that was, what types of objectives should we look for when evaluating an ETF? Leah, another awesome question. Uh, so the second part of that is, um, with an index strategy, uh, one of the objectives you'll want to look at is does it do a good job of tracking its index? So uh, you'll want to look at the return of the index. You can look this up uh, usually online and the return of the ETF. And if they're relatively close to each other, that ETF is doing a pretty good job. Uh, the second most important determinant in the selection of the ETF is the cost. So ETFs are designed to be low cost uh, performance. And as a general rule, um, the lower the cost of the ETF, uh, probably the more ideal uh, it is because we know that these are sort of fixed costs. So um, once you're getting into investment funds that are pay, you know, charging more than 1%, you probably are, are looking at stuff that's expensive. And maybe there's a reason for that. But uh, when in doubt, low cost index exposure is usually your best bet. And of course, the other thing to look at is look at the performance, uh, all the any ETF that has over a year performance, and of course on your iTrade platform, you can also look at this. You can look at the performance of the ETF and see what it's done in the past. Uh, and then a final piece is point number four, would be to look at the risk. Make sure it's appropriate risk rating. High returns usually come with high risk. And if you're uh, an investor with a shorter time horizon or nearing retirement, you know, having a heavy allocation to risk your asset classes, such as leverage ETFs or gold equities, commodities, they may not be the most appropriate investment uh, given that yes, they can generate high returns, but they come, there's no free lunch investing, they come with a high risk trade-off. So I hope that helps in terms of just some first key ways that you can look to find an ETF that might work for you. Any other questions?
And Mark, those are the only other questions that we okay. had at this point. Yeah. Perfect. Well, with that, I'll uh, say thank you to everybody. And again, please feel free to uh, reach out if you have any further questions. Uh, I love hearing from you, and uh, you know, I hope your journey into ETF investing is a success. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's a great presentation. So I'm going to just uh, transition back now over to uh, our presentation, and we'll do the quick wrap-up sessions. And uh, as, as Mark had mentioned, if you do have any other questions, uh, do feel free to uh, jot them down, and uh, we can address them before the end of the presentation, or I can send an email over to Mark at Horizons. So let me uh, up a little bit. All right, so thank you, Mark. I really appreciate that. Uh, great information. Uh, so going forward, what is next for us? Um, you can access, as I mentioned, the webinar recordings on our YouTube channel at um, www.scotiaitrade.com. Scroll down to the bottom of the page, and there you will find the YouTube link. You can click on that, go to the Webinars on Demand playlist, and uh, you can then look for one of the webinars that you're uh, interested in. Now, after you exit the webinar session today, we will... Uh, uh, upload a short survey for you and we ask kindly that you uh, just um, visit that for a little bit. It takes about maybe say five, five, five to six minutes. Uh, if you could just let us know how, we, uh, how we've done today and um, the offerings that we've been providing so far, if they're meeting your needs or if you have anything else that you'd like to have us uh, uh, provide in the way of education. We certainly appreciate uh, uh, that information. So mark your calendars going forward. We have uh, coming forward July 13th, key strategies for bear markets with the market guys. Uh, this is an interesting one, so um, I uh, encourage you to join up and, and to listen in as there is some key information there for you. And then on July 25th, the Montreal Exchange will be providing another uh, webinar on implementing a trading strategy, option fundamentals. So uh, if you're interested in trading options, this is a great one for those who are interested in starting out uh, with their option trading. So as mentioned, you can uh, get access to the webinars on demand or the webinars that we've got coming forward under the scotiaitrade.com website. Click on the education uh, tab and there you can click on the events calendar. There you can find all the webinars that we've got coming forward all the way out to the end of the year. So I uh, do encourage you to uh, go and check that out uh, at your earliest possible convenience. So on behalf of Scotia Trade and uh, the Client Education Department here, I would like to thank Mark uh, Noble from Horizons ETS for a wonderful presentation. And I would also like to thank you, our attendees, for uh, uh, sticking with us and for attending today. We hope that the information was uh, beneficial and useful for your investment journey. Let me now take a few seconds to upload the presentation and uh, we can close off today. Next few moment. Okay, another few seconds and that will be completed. Okay, great. So if you go to the handout panel in your GoToWebinar toolbar on your screen, just open up that handout panel. You'll see that I've uploaded the PDF version of today's deck. Uh, just uh, download that to your computer and then tomorrow when you receive the recording from today, uh, for today's session, you can then review both of those together and you can keep those on your own records as well too. So thank you once again, have yourself a great day, and we look forward to seeing you again next time.